Good afternoon, good morning and good evening everyone and welcome to our webinar on unwrapping conflict of interests in chemicals and waste governance. My name is Martin Scheringer and I am the host of the event today. We are very happy to see the huge interest in this event. People are still joining. We have received many uh, registrations and it's now my great pleasure to welcome our speakers for today and our moderator. The speakers are David Azulay, Laura Vandenberg, David Michaels, Rob Bilot, and Marcos Orlana. And the moderator is Jane Munke. Many thanks to all of you for your willingness to com contribute here to the event today and to make the seminar possible. Before we start, I would like to say a few words about our intention for this webinar. And for this, I will share a couple of slides quickly. <clears throat> so this webinar is organized by the IPCP, the International Panel on Chemical Pollution. And the IPCP is an international network of academic scientists working on chemical pollution issues. You can find information about the IPCP, about our goals, our bylaws, the way we work and what we do at ipcp.ch. Over the last couple of years, as a main topic of the IPCP, we have worked on in the area of a global science policy panel on chemicals and waste. And in 2019, we published this extensive mapping and gap analysis of existing science policy interface bodies in the area of chemicals and waste. And this is available from Zenodo. If you want to take a look, this is an extensive document. And then in 2021, we published this article in the journal Science, where we outlined why such a panel would be useful. A concern in the context of such a panel and also in many other areas of chemicals management, for example, from SICEM to the existing multilateral environmental agreements, such as the Stockholm Convention or the Minamata Convention, to the ongoing discussions and negotiations about a new plastics treaty. In all these areas, a concern is that vested interests may have an undue influence on important decisions. Vested interests exist, and uh, it's, uh, it's normal, it's not a bad thing that they exist, they are legitimate. But an important question, and that's the question for today here is, how can and should they be handled in such a way that we can avoid that they influence important decisions in an undue way, decisions where many different perspectives have to be considered, and also where facts and data and information has to be considered uh, in, in the correct way. So here we have to understand and find ways of handling the identifying and handling possible influences of vested interests. The only official or formal tool for addressing them in vested interests is a conflict of interest declaration. Conflict of interest declaration are used in many contexts, for example, also in the work of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, but the question for us here is, are they enough? Are they sufficient? Or is it all more complicated and demanding to really identify and understand and handle conflicts of interest beyond what we can see from a declaration of conflict of interest? This is the guiding question for our webinar today. And this is the area where our speakers have a lot of experience. And we are now looking forward to the insights they are going to share with us. And with this, I would like to conclude here and thank you all for being here. Thank you to the speakers and I will now hand over to Jane. Yes, hello and welcome from me as well. So um, we will dive right into our session. Um, we have five fantastic panelists and I will introduce them one after the other and each of them will have five to ten minutes to present um, an initial statement. And so we start with David Adzulai, or David A, as I will be calling you today, since we have two Davids on the panel. 
David Azula works for the Center for International Environmental Law, short CL, as you can see in his background. And he is CL's Geneva Office's Managing Attorney and also the Director of CL's Environmental Health Program. David uh, is based in Switzerland. Um, he trained to be an attorney in France and in Spain, and he's worked in legal practice as well as for a long time now in the civil society world. David is deeply involved in several ongoing processes, such as at the European Union, the OECD, and also, uh, of course, at the United Nations. Um, and from his work experience, he has many stories to share on how conflicts of interest can play a role and do play a role. David, um, you've worked for such a long time in policy processes, and you have seen a lot of vested interests. Um, and you told me that to you, this seems so obvious. Um, but if you were introducing this topic to someone who's not so familiar with this, what are the key issues to pay attention to? <clears throat> Hello, everyone, and thanks, Jane, for the question, and thanks for the uh, to the IPCP for organizing such uh, a great webinar. So, indeed, when we prepared, uh, uh, and, and you thought people will need to know a little more about this, what originally felt strange to me is that this is this is sort of the core aspect of the work that we do. I've been involved in regulatory processes for over fifteen years. And I don't think I've ever been involved in any process that did not involve uh, some form of corporate uh, interest or some corporate capture of the regulatory process. Uh, overall, this is uh, historically very well documented in a, a landmark report that was done by the environmental the European Environmental Agency, the EIA, uh, called Late Lessons from Early Warning, where they document how the world has been very late to respond to many, many early warnings. And in most of those cases, if not all of those cases, the result for those late actions uh, was the impact of corporate capture and corporate influence in those regulatory processes. So I, I, I tried to identify a few uh, examples of what I've personally encountered over the past um, over 15 years and I've tried to distinguish them from the different approaches and different uh, uh, techniques that are being used to influence and, and duly influence some of those regulatory processes. So the, the one of the first example, of course, is the direct engagement and direct involvement in regulatory processes and the manufacturing of doubt. Uh, this is very this is something that is very well documented in many spaces from climate to chemical uh, regulations and others. <clears throat> And some of what uh, some of the examples that I remember quite well, one was the preparation from uh, of a state of the science report on endocrine disrupting chemicals that was prepared jointly by UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program, and the World Health Organization. And of course, through this, <clears throat> what happened is that many scientists were involved. Many stakeholders were consulted, and <clears throat> industries with vested interest made sure that they appointed friendly scientists that could sow doubt into what is very commonly uh, understood as the state of the science. And what the, the what that led to, for example, was that. After, uh, first of all, it led to a very long delay in publishing the actual report. And also what it led to was that, while originally uh, most of the participants agreed to present a list of known endocrine disruptors and suspected endocrine disruptor chemicals, there was extreme pressure and a lot of doubt manufacturing to make sure that no such list would be included in the report. So there was a lot of protracted back and forth around this. And in the end, the list were not including the report. But however, uh, when the report came from for adoption in front of the governing body of the SICAM, the Strategic Approach for International Chemical Management, which is a uh, uh, international global instruments to address and regulate uh, chemicals interna internationally, all stakeholders, governments, and civil society, and everyone agreed to uh, welcome the report and 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 adopted and inserted in the, the corpus of text that were SICAM. But at this point, industry representatives raised their flag and insisted that they could not accept it, even though they had strongly influenced the content of it. And they 
they requested that a footnote be indicated in the report of the meeting to, to explain that the industry represented, which were mostly uh, chemical manufacturers, did not in fact agree, nor welcome, nor endorse the report to which they had largely participated in contributing to uh, watering down. We see similar so sorts of involvement in scientific bodies of international conventions, such as the Stockholm Conventions, the uh, so-called Pop Review Committee, the Pop Rock, uh, where uh, industries are represented and are extremely vocal in defending each of, of their chemicals that they represent, both for, to delay adoption of restrictive measures, as well as to support um, exception and exemptions for the use, for certain uses. So that's one direct uh, that's a, one direct way of involving. A second way of engaging in those processes is to infuse government position, because of course regulatory processes are based on government decisions. So it's to infuse government position with their so-called views. And we saw that again, there was a, quite a, a, an impressive example. We, we see that in all, of, honestly, in all of the spaces that I've seen, but one of the most obvious example that we saw was recently in one of the decision on of the pop rock, the pop review committee that is supposed to identify those specific, the, the pop chemicals for them to be regulated under the Stockholm Convention, uh, we saw one government put forward as their submission something that was a direct copy and paste from an industry position. And once this was identified and they were called out on this, they had to um, withdraw their submission and look a little embarrassed about this. At least in this case, uh, they had the decency to look embarrassed. That is not always the case. And sometimes it is actually being justified in, uh, in many different ways. Another way that we see this is the, in the functioning of the Rotterdam Convention. The Rotterdam Convention is an international convention that, re, that puts in place a requirement for prior and free informed consent for the international trades of chemicals. If a country, if as a country, you want to export one of the chemicals listed on the annexes of the convention to another country, you have to provide this uh, receiving country with a lot of information about the toxicity and certain aspects of um, and all ecotoxicology and ecotoxicology um, uh, elements and information about the chemicals that you want to export. And you have to wait for the importing countries to provide um, it's free and prior informed consent to receiving these documents. So it's not even a convention that restricts or prohibits the transfer or the trade of these uh, materials. It really just uh, uh, an instrument that ensure that information is being shared about this between exporting and importing countries. And even though a, a number of substances have made it through all of the scientific assessment processes, uh, it still require a decision by the conference of the party, by the governments to list set chemicals on the annexes. And you may be surprised to hear that the Rotterdam Convention has not been able to list uh, such high profile substances as asbestos or paraquat in the annexes of the convention because uh, industries have been lobbying their government so strongly to make sure that some governments would oppose such decision. And we'll go back to this, uh, to uh, the, the particular case of asbestos and others to showcase some other examples of how industry tried to influence uh, international decision making. Another way that vested interest will manipulate the regulatory processes is by weaponizing uh, some aspects of the regulatory processes or some aspects of, yeah, some aspects of the regulatory processes. For example, we know that more and more countries are now uh, putting in place what is called regulatory risk assessment before adopting any new regulation, which is trying to assess what the impact of a possible regulation will be uh, before it can be adopted and enacted. And here we have, again, very uh, well documented uh, examples of how certain industry, and in this case, for example, the tobacco industry, had very strongly pushed uh, the European Union to adopt strict a regulatory risk assessment procedure, because through this procedure, uh, they can um, 
overblow the potential costs to society or potential costs to their own industries or to the market or to the job market and uh, use that to weigh in on the balance uh, to prevent regulations from, from being adopted. In fact, this is also a process that is very well documented in a number of reports. In all of the examples of regulatory risk assessment that have been done for the past 10 to 15 years in the EU, the costs that industry claim uh, they will have to suffer from any sorts of uh, restricting regulation is in average uh, overblown by a factor of 10. Basically, industries claim a 10 times more potential cost from restricting, um, uh, from restricting certain substances on their business with the uh, scary and fear-mongering uh, consequences about job markets in countries, et cetera. And so that is also a way to skew the regulatory process uh, towards uh, less restrictions or to, towards uh, delaying or more lenient processes. But all of this, I would say, is... Uh, almost part of every day's game, but sometimes industry vested interests go even further than this and engage in criminal activities, clear criminal activities to delay processes or to derail processes. And here there is a, a I hate to say this, but a great example, because this is one example that was actually identified and uh, that could be exposed, that happened in the context of the Rotterdam Convention. So I mentioned that the Rotterdam Convention before has been trying to list asbestos as one of of the substances uh, for which exporting countries would have to um to share information with the importers. And because for many years this decision has been opposed, there were a coalition of uh, scientists and civil society groups that coordinated to try to make sure that the decisions would be adopted and that asbestos would finally be listed on the, uh, on the annexes of the Rotterdam Convention. And at some point, uh, there was an independent filmmaker that produced a film uh, in collaboration with WHO on uh, asbestos victim in India. So it's someone that went to film the gruesome death and life conditions of asbestos victim in India. And this was really a, a, a gruesome film. And this person, uh, the, the filmmaker, got little by little because he presented himself as wanting to fight against the scourge of the impacts of asbestos, embedded himself in the core uh, strategic group creating the strategy for the civil society and scientist groups trying to, uh, to advocate for the listing of asbestos. Uh, this person got embedded in all of the strategic, strategic discussion, participated in the uh, closed meeting where the, the, the people were discussing how to influence those decisions. And after a few years, uh, it turned out that this person was actually being paid by the asbestos industry. So he was, this was someone who had been paid to produce a film, who you know, could produce a film about the terrible impacts about this and use this as an entry point to make his way into where um, health, uh, activists or uh, health scientists were trying to, inf to influence legal decision for better control of substances such as asbestos to be able to better understand the strategy of those trying to influence those decisions and share that with the governments and mm -hmm. producing industry. So that is also something that I've witnessed. Great. If I, if Thanks, I have one David. minute left, do I have you one have minute less left? than one minute. <laughs> okay, I just want to mention that there are ways and there are examples of how this has been adequately managed beyond a mere con declaration of conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. And one example that is useful to keep in mind is how the WHO has managed to adopt very strong regulation globally to restrict uh, the use of tobacco, which was the, uh, the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, where tobacco industries were barred and forbidden to participate even as observers into yeah. the negotiating process and into the working of the, of the convention. Let, let's hold that thought, David, because I want to get back to that specific example. Thank you so much. That was, uh, I got goosebumps listening to you. Um, okay, thanks, David. Our next speaker now is Professor Laura Vandenberg. Uh, she's an assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and a very successful and also still fairly young academic. 
uh, working on early life exposures to chemicals and health effects later in life. Uh, Laura is focused in her work on endocrine disruption um, as a mechanism of toxicity that's often overlooked by traditional toxicology. And as a result, uh, current risk assessments often fail to comprehensively capture the effects of man-made synthetic chemicals that are indeed endocrine disruptors, like bisphenol A and so on. Uh, Laura also is the well-deserved recipient of the 2016 Pearl Award uh, in recognition of her outstanding leadership in conducting critical research to identify and address the many issues concerning endocrine disruptors. Uh, Laura, you've worked on uh, expert panels, you've done chemical risk assessment uh, for government uh, together with fellow academics. And apart from the vested interests that uh, are clearly associated with an industry agenda and that David was um, going into right now, some academics may also have an industry agenda, but that often is hidden. So what is the science of spin, as you call it in one of your uh, scientific publications, and how can it be identified? Yeah, great. Thank you, Jane. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I will just apologize to those of you who are joining by phone. I'm going to share some slides, which are mostly just to help me keep on on time here. Um, but I'll make sure if you're if you're not able to see the slides and you're just listening that that you can follow along. Um, so uh, David A um, hinted at this topic that's um, that you're going to also hear more about from David M, um, who's really I think the the leading scholar and that um, my work has really relied on significantly. Um, to talk about this issue of manufactured doubt. And when, um, so I've been studying chemicals in my lab for now 15 years, more than 15 years. Um, and I've been studying uh, how, how uh, chemicals have impacts on hormone sensitive outcomes. That's what I'm really trained to do. I'm an endocrinologist and developmental biologist, but it's impossible to be a part of this field as a researcher and not be aware of um, some of those important texts that David A. Um, talked about. Uh, uh, Early warnings um, is an example of a really important text that helps us to, um, to recognize the way that information about environmental chemicals has evolved, but also been manipulated. And that led me to really working with um, one of my students, Rebecca Goldberg, um, to try to understand what are the tactics and techniques that are used by individuals or corporations um, or, or sometimes groups of people that have a vested interest in a topic. And then use that and often hide that interest that they really have in order to deliberately alter and misrepresent knowable information. And I want to sort of make that distinction because th that's where the distinction is between someone like my auntie who has a blog, who says something that's inaccurate, but you know, that's misinformation, right? She, she, she doesn't know better. She's not a scientist and she doesn't benefit in any personal way from spreading something that's just not true. We're really talking about groups that ultimately benefit from from uh, presenting information that's not true. And so what Rebecca and I did was to construct a framework and, and we've published two papers that are um, open access papers. And the latter one is the one that Jane just referred to, the science of spin. Um, so anyone can um, access this paper. It's published in the journal Environmental Health and Jane's um, uh, got a copy in front of her, I can see. And what we did in this paper is we started by looking at five Five very distinct industries um, or groups of people. In the case of climate change, we focused on a group called the Marshall Institute, um, which both um, uh, David Michaels and also um, our colleague Naomi Oreskes have written quite a bit about. Um, so we focused across these industries because they're quite different. And what we wanted to do was to see what are the tactics and approaches that are used across those, those, those broad industries to see, is there some commonality? in the tactics that they use to manipulate public knowledge in a way that benefits them. 
And what we found were 28 unique tactics. Um, they're not unique to any one industry. They're unique in, in approaches that could be used to create and disseminate disinformation. And so this is really one of those, those um, tools that we think that is useful to organizations when trying to determine if what they're seeing really is manufactured doubt um, and disinformation. And I just want to point out, these, this is not a checklist. Um, it does require some knowledge to be able to apply uh, the, the um, evaluation of these tactics. And of course, there are um, excellent organizations that are using some of these tactics, like hosting conferences and seminars, right? We're doing it right now. Uh, I would not argue that this is a, um, a disinformation um, tactic, but the, but the hosting of conferences and seminars can be misused by organizations. For example, we've seen polluting industries that invite journalists to conferences that from the outside look like they're science conferences. But when you actually pull it apart, it's only uh, individuals presenting the side of a polluting industry to those journalists as a way to try to craft relationships with them. When we looked across the five industries and groups that we were investigating, we looked at which of those tactics were unique to a single organization. And there were a few. You can see um, the Marshall Institute has Tactic 25 um, uh, affiliated with it. And you can go to our paper and see what those numbers actually mean. But what we boiled this down to is that there are five shared tactics that we've seen broadly used across um, organizations and industries. Number one is, to attack the science itself by attacking study design. And every study has a flaw. As a scientist, no one could tell you that they've ever designed a perfect study. It doesn't exist. Um, and as scientists, we should be talking about what the strengths and weaknesses of our study, of our approaches, our, our techniques are. Here, what we're talking about is attacking aspects of the study design that are central to science by overinflating issues related to bias or sample size concerns or confounding. Number two is one that um, David A. Um, has already talked a bit about, which is being able to recruit people who have a strong reputation in one area and exploit that positive reputation in an area in which they really don't belong. An example would be inviting me to speak about climate change. I'm no expert in climate change. Uh, a third example would be actually misrepresenting data, cherry picking data, designing studies to get the result that you want. Um, any scientist who's a good scientist could also be a bad scientist and design a study to purposefully show no effect of something that's harmful. We've seen this consistent use of um, hyperbolic language. This is one that irritates me in particular because it's really easy to just call something junk. Um, and it's really hard to fight against the kinds of terms that we've seen industries create, like sound science. Um, and Naomi Reskes has this great quote, sound science sounds like science, but it's not, right? That's actually a, a, a whole label that was created by the tobacco industry. And then again, as David um, talked about already, the uh, inappropriate proximity to regulatory bodies. And some of what we've seen is referred to as the revolving door, right? Folks who get a job working for a polluting industry, then leave that job to go work for a regulatory agency that evaluates that polluting industry, and then they move right back. And so they move in and out of these, um, these overlapping relationships. Another really important thing that we noticed is that many of these tactics rely on logical fallacies. And in some parts of the world, you are trained to identify and think about logical fallacies. In the part of the world where I did my early education, that was not the case. And the reason why logical fallacies work is that they appeal to natural ways of thinking that are just happen to be flawed ways of thinking, right? So an example could be, um, I don't like that person. So therefore, I don't believe anything that person says. So, you know, aligning an argument with um, a, a personality, instead of with the information that's being provided that personality, or by saying, this is an authority, you know, in, in academia, we often say, oh, well, if the dean says it, the provost says it, it's got to be the way that it's done. And in reality, that authority doesn't actually lead to um, some sort of uh, a handle on the, on the knowledge.
Um, so I, I'm going to stop there and just mention that um, I know we're going to talk about this and hopefully Jane will lead this discussion. When we talk about tools, one of the tools is to actually educate people on how to identify those logical fallacies. And unfortunately, there have been some studies that show that even 30% of scientists can fail to identify a pretty simple logical fallacy. So even those of us who think we're being trained to identify them, we fall for them. And the reason why is that they're comfortable for us. So we have to keep reminding people of what they look like so we can attack them when we see them. Great, Laura. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's almost this like the system one, system two thinking, hey? <laughs> so we really have to be very conscious uh, of, of, of these mechanisms. And that's also one of the reasons why we're having this webinar today. Great, now we're on to our next David, or David Michaels, as he is known, or David M. here today. David Michaels is an epidemiologist by training and professor at the George Washington University uh, School of Public Health, uh, that's in the United States of America. Um, David served as Assistant Secretary of Labor for the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, uh, shortly known as OSHA, from 2009 to uh, 2017. And before uh, he was Assistant Secretary of Energy for Environment Safety and Health. Um, David is an advocate for scientific integrity and he is the author of two well-known books and excellently written books, I have to say, uh, on the issue, uh, Doubt is Their Product, uh, that came out 2008 and The Triumph of Doubt, 2020. Um, it's not happy reading, but it's very important and informative reading. Um, David has received many important awards, but I'll skip over this long list now so that we can hear from him directly. Um, I hope you uh, excuse me for that, David. Um, David M., based on your extensive research into the dark science of deception, what are the key challenges when dealing with conflicts of interest in the policy arena and are they a health risk, these conflicts of interest? And if yes, how can we protect our democratic processes from this disease? Boy, uh, those are important questions, Jane. Thank you for inviting me and thanks to the IPCP and to David and Laura for their presentations. I think this follows well on that. And you know, as another academic, I actually put together a few uh, slides as well. Um, so what I've seen both in my research and in a couple of government um, uh, terms is this rise of corporate disinformation, and I've thought about ways to address it. So manufacturing doubt is what we see. Uh, unfortunately, what, um, what I've seen is it's now standard operating procedure for corporations to essentially create and disseminate disinformation by manufacturing uncertainty. That's what you heard from Laura about the harms of their products. And this really is dangerous. It has a huge impact on regulation because that, that's the, the point of it. Um, we're gonna talk about that from a couple of different angles. To think about though, you have to of course think about tobacco because they're the most effective model and they really wrote the playbook. And a lot of the scientists who we now see working for the chemical industry, for other industries actually work for tobacco. I know that's sort of a, a shocking thought, but it's really true. Um, Tobacco, of course, we know, realize that to defend its you know, product that kills millions of people a year, they have to create doubt. And there's a famous quote, doubt is our product, since it's the best means of competing with a body of fact that exists in the minds of the general public. It's the means of establishing controversy. And that's from a memo written by the tobacco industry. Um, this field product defense, what is it? It's scientists and it's, it's consulting firms, they're very lucrative, who are hired to defend hazardous products or activities in the policy, regulatory, or legal arenas. And this is their business model. This is what they do. This is where they make their money. And they produce whatever results their sponsors want. If they didn't do that, they'd be out of business. So when you see a, a report, I sometimes call them strategic literature reviews. They review the literature and use some of those same tactics that Laura described. Of course, they find that every study is flawed and the evidence is not adequate to regulate, to change policy. Um, they don't provide valid science. They provide support for the product. Um, the thinking behind this, 
And this is again sort of the sort of psychology behind this is what they're saying is this is the loss of presumptive innocence. And that idea really comes from the criminal justice system where we believe people should be considered to be innocent until they're proven guilty. So they've taken that and the very subtle and underhand way applied that to chemicals. Of course, chemicals don't deserve presumptive innocence. Why should we say they have to be proven to be guilty? They have to kill people before we regulate them. And that's sort of, it's, it's backwards thinking, but that's what they apply. So I'll give you one example, and you'll hear much more about this from, from Rob uh, Billet, who's sort of the hero of uh, the PFAS story. Um, chemicals are widely used. Um, many of you have seen the Dark Waters movie, or you've read the C8 studies, that um, independent scientists, these are scientists who are cho chosen by both uh, representatives of sick workers and, and um, Rob and DuPont, did studies where they could really do what they need to do to show what the risks were. And they showed that um, PFOA was associated with a number of different diseases. Um, 3M, which makes this product, then hired Exponent to produce a strategic literature review, which said, you know, the causal uh, association isn't can't be shown. Similarly, um, there was another strategic literature re review taking on the U.S. National Toxicology Program's analysis that said there was an immunological hazard. Um, they said, "Oh, it should be downgraded. It's not so. It's not so dangerous." And there was even another one. I'll go through this pretty quickly, saying, "Really, there's no evidence that PFAS causes anything." Well, that was up until 2017, 2018. Um, Finally, uh, 3M agreed to settle that suit with the state of Minnesota for $850 million. So they figured that report wasn't going to do very well. Um, EPA has issued advisories saying exposure safe exposure levels are infinitesimally low. And 3M has finally said they're getting out of the business. But they use these private defense firms to stay, to keep in business for a long time and to fight off regulation and litigation. We know these firms are you know, why they why they exist, because when you go to Glassdoor, which has um, information from employees who say things like, this is a law consulting company, not a science consulting company. Don't expect to be a scientist if you work there. Or for a Gradient employee wrote, some of the principal scientists have questionable ethics and they've been called out for it. Or sometimes you'll be working for evildoers trying to make it seem like they did nothing wrong. I think this has a big impact, not just on this particular field, but it leads to the cynicism and anti-science um, condition that we see across the world right now, because they see scientists fighting over things they shouldn't be fighting over. Um, so I've written a lot about this in my books. That's one that Triumph of Doubt actually just came out in paperback and Chinese, if you want more about that. But more than just thinking about product defense, even academic scientists who think they're doing the right thing find the results their sponsors want. And that's what the funding effect is. It's been widely, widely uh, identified. There are many studies that show it. Here's one on e-cigarettes, for example. It turns out that if um, you work for an e-cigarette company and you do a study, you're not very likely to find an unfavorable result, unfavorable to, their, to your sponsor. And if you're independent, you're more likely to find harm. So you don't want studies to be done by academics who are working for uh, company sponsors. And I think we have really good proof that it's not even that people are lying. Unconsciously, their mind is shaped by um, this re financial relationship. The best example is Vioxx, which was a, a painkiller that, that um, a, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug that was um, developed by Merck, um, Merck did a randomized trial comparing Vioxx with Aleve or naproxen, um, showed it was a successful painkiller. It was licensed by the FDA and really all over the world, hundreds of thousands of people took it. Um, some scientists looked at the data and said, wait a minute, you know, it may be a successful painkiller, but if you compare Vioxx with Aleve or naproxen, after about a year of follow-up, people taking this drug are more than twice as likely to have a major cardiovascular event like a heart attack. And that is phenomenally important. But academic scientists associated with Merck looked at that and they dismissed it. 
Uh, here's an example in the letter to the editor of JAMA, where an academic scientist from uh, New England Medical Center said, look, um, this analysis provides no substantive support for the, those conclusions. There are several possible explanations, including the protective effects resulting from the antiplatelet action of naproxen. Well, antiplatelet action, being, essentially they're saying that if you took a leave or a naproxen, you're less likely to have a heart attack because it's protective. Now, we don't have a drug that prevents 60% of heart attacks. If we did, we'd put it in the water supply. Now, in this case, we have this great natural experiment because at the same time that this one study was going on, it, um, Merck was testing to see whether uh, Biots could prevent colon polyps, and we don't have a uh, prevention for colon polyps, so it was done with the placebo trial, and the placebo trial results look just like the other ones. After a year, if you took Biots, you were twice as likely to have a heart attack. In fact, if you look at the two of them, the, the numbers are identical. So how do you possibly explain that these academic physicians couldn't see this? Um, talk about motivated reasoning, the tendency to find arguments in favor of conclusions we want to believe to be stronger than arguments for conclusions we don't want to believe. Or another way to think about this was from the, the famous American writer Upton Sinclair, it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on him not understanding it. So we can address this problem, but it, it means that you have to recognize that academics with a financial uh, conflict of interest, and not just academics, obviously, if you work for a corporation or you work for a product defense firm, your views are biased. They can't, you can't avoid that. So the World Health Organization International Agency for Research on Cancer actually recognizes this. They've had all sorts of problems with biased um, scientists who are on their um, monograph panels, the panels that figure out whether something is carcinogenic to humans. So they've said, if you have a financial conflict of interest, you can't be on the panel. You can't hold a pen. You can't vote. You can't write the report. Industry says, wait a minute, we're the experts. We know more about these chemicals than anyone. We make the chemicals. Shouldn't we have some input? And they say, well, yes. And we will invite some of you to the process so you can give us some information. You'll be an invited expert, but you're not on the panel. You don't have a vote and you can only have limited influence. I think that's very successful. So the point here is to remember that disclosure of conflicts of interest is necessary, but not sufficient. Um, if we want to ensure unbiased decision-making, unconflicted scientists should be excluded from efforts to synthesize the scientific evidence, to look at the, all, all the evidence to decide whether to regulate, and they should be uh, excluded from developing public health policy. Um, in addition, I'll just take one more moment here, I think we also have to remember that we have to recognize the existence of real uncertainty because there always is uncertainty. Studies are always problematic, but there's you have to distinguish that from manufactured uncertainty, and we have to build the evidence base with research produced by unconflicted scientists. So um, thank you. Thank Thanks, you so David much. And uh, <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, that that was uh, that was really uh, informative, um, and I especially like the quote by uh, Upton Sinclair. But we will get back to that. Um, good. So moving on, you perfectly set the scene already for our Mr. Pifoa, uh, if I'm allowed to call you that, <laughs> Rob. Rob Bilot is an environmental lawyer with the law firm Taft, Stephanus, and Hollister. He's based in Cincinnati. That's also in the USA. And Rob surprised himself by suing one of the largest chemical companies, not only once, but a couple of times, over their handling of the perfluorinated chemical PFOA, uh, which is a persistent chemical that poisoned thousands and thousands of people in the US through the water supply, and which has led to exposure of virtually the entire global population with this persistent forever chemical. Rob has written a fascinating book about his experience called Exposure uh, that came out five years ago and it was turned into a Hollywood motion picture movie, uh, which uh, came out in 2019. 
And since then, um, the US Environmental Protection Agency, US EPA, uh, has been willing to meet with the actor who played Rob in the movie, but they still don't want to speak to him directly. And I think that's really their loss because Rob is a very nice and smart person. Uh, and Rob also has a long list of laurels and achievements, which are all absolutely amazing. I just want to highlight the Right Livelihood Award that you received um, in 2017. Um, but let's skip over the rest of your uh, important achievements for now so that we can hear directly from you. So Rob, in your experience, what are the strategies that are employed by chemical corporations to muddy the waters when it comes to their conflicts of interest in environmental litigation and in policy making? And why does it matter so much to have transparency on this issue? Oh, thanks, Jane. And first of all, thanks so much for having me on this panel. It's really impressive a group of folks and really an honor to be here today speaking with all of you. You know, I think I experienced about every one of the aspects you heard from, from all the prior speakers in the situation involving these forever chemicals or PFAS as we now call them. You know, I'm a practicing attorney and, and I first started delving into these issues 24 years ago. Uh, where when I had a farmer that showed up in my office trying to figure out why his cows were dying after drinking some white foam coming out of a landfill next to his property. And, you know, I delved into this trying to, to get to the bottom of what was, what, was, what was making his cow sick. And it was in that process that I discovered that there was an incredibly toxic chemical um, in the water that these cows were drinking. And it wasn't just in the water the cows were drinking. This stuff, it turned out, was in the drinking water virtually all over the planet. And it wasn't just in the drinking water. It was getting into the fish, into wildlife everywhere, into the soil, into the air, and most importantly, into the blood of virtually every person on the planet and virtually every living thing. And what I was seeing as I was digging into these documents uh, from the companies that were that were making this material and dumping it in this landfill next to this farmer's property was this stuff was incredibly toxic, persistent, bioaccumulative, biopersistent, carcinogenic. And this had been known going back decades. You know, I'm digging into these documents in the late 1990s, early 2000s, and I'm seeing studies going back to the 1950s and 1960s. I mean, even before the U.S. regulatory agencies came into existence, you know, and, and it's showing pretty clear evidence that this stuff is pretty bad, pretty toxic. And yet I'm seeing their sampling data indicating it's in drinking water, it's in people's blood, it's everywhere. But there was no information that had gotten out about this. And I was trying to figure out how does this happen? You know, this by the time I was looking at it, this, these chemicals had been in use for decades. They had managed to contaminate the globe. They were incredibly persistent, toxic and carcinogenic and all of this, yet nobody seemed to know anything about this. How was that possible? And naively, I thought I could pull this information together, provide it to the regulatory agencies and, and into the court system, and this would all be fixed. The regulators would step in and they would see what needed to be done and they would take action and the court system would let. And what I saw, uh, was a lot of what you just heard the other speakers talking about, which was an incredibly sophisticated system of controlling information, controlling the science. You had information about these chemicals and you had the companies that were making and releasing these materials deciding what was going to be published and peer reviewed, what data would make it out into the scientific journals. They were then also then capturing the scientific journals. They were setting up who was going to do the peer review of these journals. They were purposely seeding the literature. They were creating an entire strategies to figure out how do we make sure if information about these materials ever makes its way out into the public, that by the time it does, all of the science will support our view that it's not harmful. And that there were so campaigns to control the science and to, and to manipulate what went, went out to scientists and in the, in the general public, and then also to the regulatory world. 
you know, that these companies were sitting down and drafting the risk assessments. They were drafting the analyses of whether the chemical was harmful enough. They were having meetings with the regulators and presenting that data to them where the regulators would then sign off and it would suddenly become a government number or government approved. So what I, what I saw through this process really opened my eyes to the way in which the industry that was creating and releasing these incredibly toxic materials was also completely controlling the, the, the way in which the science about the materials was released into the world, was controlling the manner in which regulators reviewed this information and how the regulations were being set. And so throughout this process, we also realized we were seeing these companies taking the position, as you heard already before, there's never enough it's, it's uncertain. There's too much doubt about whether these chemicals are harmful enough. The science isn't clear yet on whether this is really causing these effects or not. And what, we be, what became very clear was these companies were never going to agree that any amount of data was ever enough. And they were always going to challenge this. And this would be litigated from now until the end of time. So when we tried to resolve this litigation out in West Virginia, where, this, where, where it started, what we decided to do was, how do we take this issue and pull it into a process where we could try to avoid all of this manipulation of the science and manipulation of the data? And what we decided to do was create an independent scientific panel where both sides would sit down and try to find people who had never worked for one side or the other, and we would sit down and we would carefully review all of their publications, all of their funding sources, who had they ever testified for before. And either side could veto for any reason, all right? And we had to pick three people that we believed were independent, had never been on one side or the other. They would then be appointed by a court who would have the power to oversee their work. And these people would be given the task of looking at all of the data about whether this chemical can cause harm or not. Not just what was published and peer reviewed, not just what was selected by one side to be, but they could look at everything and they could do their own studies. And most importantly, their work would be done, quote, in private. They would not be able to be influenced by either side or the other. Either side though, could provide data to them but it had to be done in a way that both sides saw it. It was completely transparent. If one side wanted to provide a study, it was immediately copied to the other side. And all of this was done through a court appointed neutral administrator who would handle all the communications going to this panel and any of the com communications from the panel so that we would know exactly what data these people were being given, what they were seeing. No side could have a, a private meeting with them. And even with third parties, if somebody wanted to reach out to the panel, we had a concern that there were industry groups or, or there were uh, the other side was concerned about plaintiffs groups reaching out. Any third party communication also had to go through this court appointed administrator. Both sides were shown. The panel would have to provide communications reports saying, here are the people we met with. Here are the documents we were given. So complete transparency that everybody would know everything they were seeing, everybody they talked to. And that would all be done in this transparent process supervised by a court. And the parties would have the ability to remove the panelists if there was concern about them being compromised or there had been improper influence of one way. If that, pro that panel actually was able to, to do this pretty unprecedented work of being able to confirm that these chemicals were linked to disease. Because one of the other important things we did is we realized again, it was almost, it was going to be impossible to ever meet this impossible burden standard of what is quote, causing disease. So we agreed up front in a written contract. Here's the standard. Once this, con once this standard is met, that is proof of general causation and neither side will dispute it. And these scientists, would not be subject to being drawn into depositions or cross-examined. Their work would be independently done and verified. And so all of that was done through this court process that was fully transparent. And when that work was done, and it took a long time, they ended up taking seven years to do all these massive studies. 
that's what finally got us to the point of having independent scientific proof this chemical can cause these diseases. That's what led the regulatory agencies to finally move forward and start regulating these. And we did it twice. We first did it with a panel of epidemiologists whose task was to determine, can this chemical cause disease in people at this dose level? Then once they were finished and had linked it to disease, we sat down and picked a new panel, this time of medical doctors. We went through the same process of fully vetting and researching people who had to be completely independent, having them then appointed by the court. They had to go through this process of also any communications had to be shared with both sides, copied to both sides. They had to do their work in private. And most importantly, when both of these panels were done, they had to report their results to the court first, where it was made public before it goes out for peer review and all of that. Because what we had seen throughout this process was particularly with a chemical like what we were dealing with, with PFAS, most of the science, because of this plan that had been implemented decades earlier, most of the science that was already existing had been published by the company scientists or their, or their consulting firms. So when articles were going out for peer review, they were being sent to the people who'd published before, which were these guys. So it was, getting, it was getting rejected as junk science, all right, by the Sound Science Institute and the people we heard about, talked about before. So we knew we had to let these scientists get this information out without going through that, what we viewed to be influenced process of peer review. So we set this up to where the scientists did their work and then they reported it to the court. It became public first. Then they could go out and do peer review and get publications, which they did. It was all published and peer reviewed eventually. But we wanted these procedures in place to avoid what we had been seeing going on for decades, that the science was being controlled, the peer review process was being controlled, the regulatory process was controlled. Mm -hmm. And these panels both ended up coming out with pretty groundbreaking work. The scientific panel, the epidemiologists were able to confirm the links with disease. The medical panel then created a massive uh, medical monitoring protocol, the first in the world for these chemicals, with the recommendations of what would be done. When that independent work came out, that's what led to the regulatory agencies finally moving forward to yeah. start setting regulatory standards. And because it had been done through this very carefully controlled independent process, it had great credibility. Mm -hmm. And then unfortunately we saw what uh, Professor Michaels just talked about. You know, the attempts to then try to continue to discredit mm -hmm. it by having company consulting firms, company scientists generate new quote, more recent reviews saying, oh, well, it's still not certain. It's mm -hmm. still, we still need more information. So what we now see is uh, I'm trying right now in the US to do this again, because as we did this for one chemical, PFOA, now we see that there's thousands of these PFOS out there. And I'm seeing those same arguments and that same, that same effort again by the consulting firms and the, and the industry folks to say, we don't know enough about these others to do anything. So through litigation, I'm now trying to set up a new scientific panel to look at this broader group doing it the same independent way. And we'll see if that happens. But well, it can let, be let's done. Let's get into that, Rob. Sorry to interrupt you. Let's get into that in our discussion. Um, but this is all absolutely fascinating and very, very informative. And I'm, I'm starting to wonder whether there isn't also a lesson for our regulators in that experience. There's certainly one for us scientists. Uh, we know that peer review doesn't really work great. But um, before we get into the discussion, I'd love to transition to our final panelist. Um, last but not least, uh, that's Marcos Orellana. Hello, Marcos. Um, like David M, Marcus is at George Washington University in the US where he teaches international environmental law. And in addition, um, he's an expert in the law on human rights and the environment. And in this role currently, he is the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Toxics and Human Rights. Uh, maybe you've never heard of this uh, role or mandate before, but uh, the exposure of people to harmful substances without their prior informed consent is 
indeed a human rights issue. And so I think uh, Marcos and his colleagues at the United Nations have a lot of work to do because we know people are exposed to hundreds, if not thousands of these chemicals. Uh, since taking up the mandate as special rapporteur, Marcos has published several reports. Um, first, uh, the right to science in the context of toxic substances. And uh, the second one, the stages of plastics uh, life cycle and their impacts on human rights. And both of those reports are important. And one of the reasons why we're here today, because those reports uh, also initiated these important uh, policy processes that are happening at the United Nations right now that Martin referred to. Marcos, in your experience working on chemicals and human rights, what are the key challenges when it comes to conflicts of interest? Um, what has your experience been with vested interests, particularly in the policy processes at the United Nations. And um, yeah. Thank you very much, Jane, for that uh, introduction and to IPCP for the invitation. I'm, I'm so honored to uh, join such distinguished uh, figures in the field. As uh, you mentioned, Jane, the, the mandate I hold has was conferred to me by the Human Rights Council of the United Nations. It is a monitoring and reporting mandate uh, that uh, has been described as uh, the eyes and ears of the council. How does it relate to um, reality and how can it use uh, the tools of visibility to shed light on human rights infringements and violations that result from exposure to hazardous substances and wastes. So all these tools include country visits, communications uh, to countries, to uh, companies, and thematic reports. And as you mentioned, in 2021, I reported to the Human Rights Council uh, on the right to science in the context of, um, of toxics. And that is because the right to science, while it is um, an integral part of the, uh, of the human rights um, framework, it's recognized in the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, as well as in the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, uh, it has been uh, largely neglected by <clears throat> the international community, by countries, even by human rights scholars, I would say. In short, the right to science requires states to align their policies on toxics with the best available scientific evidence. Despite this content, there is a chasm in reality between knowledge and regulatory responses. I want to give a couple of examples in addition to what um, other panelists have put on the table. At the national level, for example, I had the opportunity to conduct a, a country visit to Paraguay a couple of months ago and found that the body that decides on funding for scientific projects, so what is it that gets studied and researched, includes industry representatives and this change in composition came about after certain academicians published uh, reports using uh, public funding that showed genetic harm of children exposed uh, to pesticides. So here we have a, a, a very clear conflict and, and, and problem of design. Another example uh, on communications, uh, so cases, uh, I sent a communication to Sweden, uh, of all countries, uh, uh, with alongside seven other special procedures in regard to the dumping of more than 20,000 tons of hazardous wastes in northern Chile in mid-1980. These are hazardous wastes that are laced with arsenic and mercury and other uh, dangerous and hazardous uh, metals and chemicals in breach of existing regulations at the time. It's not a question of retroactive responsibility. The international law at the time was breached. The victims of this public health catastrophe that unfolded because the wastes uh, were dumped in a, in, a, in a city of Arica in, in Northern Chile, took their case to Swedish courts against uh, the company that, um, that was in charge of this transfer. Boliden is the name of the company. Boliden in the proceedings brought in what I've called mercenary scientists. Um, uh, David Michael spoke about product defense firm Exponent uh, to cast doubt on, 
on causation, and they were successful. The, the courts uh, ruled that um, people had gotten sick and were having problems, not because of uh, exposure to chemicals, but because of the fish they ate, among other uh, considerations. So this is an infringement of the right to science, but also it casts doubts on the right to fair trial under the European Convention on Human Rights. A couple of examples at the national level, at the global level, we've seen that chemicals and waste are exceeding what are what is the safe space for humanity to operate. Uh, this is uh, what is sometimes called uh, the, the uh, planetary boundaries. And this is no accident. And that's the, the, the sad part of this. Uh, we've heard other panelists speak about strategies by industry. The reasons for the lack of alignment between toxic policies and the available scientific evidence includes disinformation, so science for hire, the lack of participation in civil society, and the undermining of science policy interface platforms by conflicts of interest. And I want to in a couple of minutes, elaborate on a case study at the UN Environmental Assembly. UNIA is the, the acronym for short. Uh, if we go back 10 years, uh, even more now, in Rio plus 20, so this is 2012, uh, celebration at, uh, in Rio de Janeiro of the sustainable development paradigm, but also the recognition that the environmental dimension of sustainable development needed to be strengthened and the creation of UNIA as a response to this challenge, also the strengthening of public participation in UNIA. As envisioned, science policy interface is at the core of UNIA. Now, how does this work and how does public participation work? UNIA has, uh, and UNEP, the UN Environmental Program, has um, embraced the major groups approach, which is um, coming from Agenda 21. This is a blueprint that was produced back in 1992 in the Earth Summit on how to operationalize science, uh, sustainable development and bring in nine key voices in society, including the major group of science and technology. Now, even before the first UNIA, there was a big debate on how to improve participation because major groups lumps together in one bag, civil society, NGOs, industry, and scientists. It blurs the specific perspectives and the value add of each of these groups. It also undermines the ability of civil society to join, come together on substantive positions. In these debates, scientists have often argued that they are not NGOs. And NGOs have often argued that industry is not civil society. So by way of a preliminary conclusion, simply having a declaration of conflict of interest is not enough to enable meaningful input and participation. Now, the question is out there, has UNIA succeeded in strengthening the environmental dimension of sustainable development after 10 years? Well, it's a big question. Certainly, it has taken steps in the right direction. Last year, it established the Science Policy Interface Panel or Platform for Chemicals, Waste and Pollution. The design is now being negotiated. Now, the design is key to addressing the risk of conflict of interest. There are several many voices that are arguing that it should follow the uh, model of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which focuses on climate avoidance instead of conflict management. Conflict management be resting on declarations of possible uh, funding or, or conflicts. Now that under the arguments that it, this panel needs to build trust in society, trust in science, um, as well as the transaction costs involved in having to check and scrutinize every uh, declaration. But we're also hearing arguments that uh, climate change and chemicals and wastes are different. And they should be treated different because industry scientists have unique information to contribute. David Michaels talked about this point as well. So industry scientists for their affiliation should not be disqualified to participate. Now, there's an irony here, which is that the information in industry hands and in, in uh, industry scientists hands is often kept from the public because of the abuse of intellectual property rights framework. So this argument actually calls 
or could serve the basis for wholesale reform of intellectual property law at the global level that is keeping relevant uh, information on chemicals and wastes from the public. Now, the question is still on. Should there be a role for industry scientists? Well, perhaps uh, the ICAR example put on the table is interesting. Now, is that label sufficient, industry scientist? Or should it be called conflicted scientist as opposed to non-conflicted scientists or perhaps academic scientists or government scientists? So what is the principle of self-selection in the scientific community have to say about this? Uh, would uh, the scientific community speak about mercenary scientists, for example? Uh, and in that, with that label, create a space for the participation of conflicted scientists in international processes. Uh, I am uh, beyond my time, so I only want to conclude pointing out that effective science policy interface platforms are critical to support the realization of the right to science and conflicts of interest are a direct threat on the right to science. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Marcos. And again, I, I, I wish we had more time because each of you has such fascinating stories to tell and so much important things to say. So I apologize for cutting you off, but we have 20 minutes now um, for a conversation between um, the panelists, but we also ask the participants um, that are interested to get engaged, um, please ask your questions in the chat. We'll try to get to some of those if you have good questions, um, uh, but I can't promise. Um, and also just to let you know, we are recording the session and we'll make at least the talks of the panelists available afterwards, um, but not the discussion.